One morning, Sherlock Holmes handed me a sheet of paper. "Look, Watson," he said. "Can you explain this problem?" I looked at the paper. To my surprise, it was covered with a line of strange pictures. These pictures looked like little dancing men. A child must have drawn these," I said. "Where did you get this piece of paper, Holmes?" "It arrived by post this morning," answered Holmes. "A man called Hilton Cubitt of Riddling Thorpe Manor in Norfolk sent it to me. Mister Cubitt is coming to see me today." "There's a ring at the doorbell, Watson. Perhaps that's Mister Cubitt now." A moment later, a tall gentleman entered the room. He had a handsome face with clear blue eyes and looked very strong and healthy. This gentleman shook hands with both of us. Suddenly, he caught sight of the strange drawings. "Here is a mystery, Mister Holmes," he said. "What do you think of these drawings?" "They look like children's drawings," replied Holmes. "But why do you think they are important?" "I don't, Mister Holmes. But these drawings are making my wife very frightened." That's why I've come to see you. I want to find out what they mean. Holmes held up the paper, so that the sunlight shone through it. It was a page torn from a notebook, and the markings on it looked like this. Holmes examined the paper carefully, then he folded it up and put it in his pocket. This is a most interesting and unusual case, Mister Cubitt," he said. "Please." Tell us your story from the beginning. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I'm not very good at telling stories," said Mr. Cubitt. "But first, I want to explain something. I'm not rich, but I come from a very old and well-known family. My family has lived at Riddling Thorpe Manor in Norfolk for nearly five hundred years." Last year, while I was visiting London, I met an American lady called Elsie Patrick. Elsie and I became friends, and soon fell in love. I didn't know anything about Elsie's family or her past life, but I decided to ask her to marry me. The day before our wedding, Elsie spoke to me. I've had some very sad things happen to me in my past life, Hilton. I've done nothing wrong. But I wish to forget my past. Please promise me you will never ask me anything about it. If you are unable to make this promise, then please go back to Norfolk and leave me. So, I promised Elsie I would never ask her anything about her past life. We've been married for a year now, and we've been very happy. During all this time, I've kept my promise. But one day, about a month ago. My wife received a letter from America. I saw the American stamp. She read the letter, and her face turned white. Then, she threw the letter in the fire. She said nothing, but from that time, there's been a look of fear on her face. Mister Holmes, my wife is a very good woman. I'm sure she's not done anything wrong in her past life. But Elsie knows I am very proud of my family. My family's long history is very important to me. She would never do anything to upset me. Perhaps that's the reason she's afraid to tell me her troubles. Please go on," said Holmes. "Well," continued Mister Cubitt. "Yesterday morning, a strange thing happened. I found this piece of paper lying on the sundial in the garden. At first, I thought it was a child's drawing." But when I showed the paper to Elsie, she fainted. Since then, she has seemed like someone in a dream, and there's terror in her eyes. I didn't know what to do. If I took the paper to the police, they would laugh at me. So I came to you, Mister Holmes. Please help me. I'm not rich, but I'll spend all my money to protect my wife from danger. I was sorry for Mister Cubitt. He was a good man, and I saw that he loved his wife very much. Holmes did not speak for some time. Mister Cubitt, don't you think, he said at last, you should ask your wife to tell you everything. But I promised Elsie I would never ask her about her past. 
replied Hilton Cubitt. If she wants to tell me something, she will, but I will not ask her to tell me. I'll be pleased to help you, said Holmes. I believe there is a meaning in the pictures of the dancing men, but I need more information before I can say what it is. Go back to Norfolk. If there are any more pictures of dancing men, make a copy of them for me. If anything important happens, I'll come to Norfolk at once. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. During the next few days, Holmes was very quiet. Several times he looked at the paper with the dancing figures on it. Then, one afternoon, about a fortnight later, we had another visit from Mr. Cubitt. He seemed worried and tired. My wife hasn't told me anything yet, Mr. Holmes, he said. But I have more pictures of dancing men, and more important, I've seen the man who draws them. But I'll tell you everything that has happened. The morning after I visited you, I found another line of dancing men. They were drawn with chalk on the tool house which stands in the garden, near the house. I made this copy. Hilton Cubitt unfolded a paper and laid it on the table. Excellent, cried Holmes. Please, go on. After I made the copy, continued Mr. Cubitt, I cleaned off the marks. But two days later, another drawing appeared. Here it is. Holmes was delighted. We're beginning to get a lot of information, he said. I decided to find out who was drawing these pictures, went on Hilton Cubitt. So the next night, I took my gun and sat beside a window which looks out onto the garden. At about two o'clock in the morning, my wife came into the room. She was wearing her night clothes. She asked me to come to bed, but I refused. No, Elsie, I said. I want to see who is drawing these pictures. Suddenly, I saw Elsie's face turn very white in the moonlight. She was looking out of the window. I looked out of the window, too. I saw something moving near the tool house. A dark figure came slowly round the corner of the tool house and stopped beside the door. Immediately, I picked up my gun. I wanted to run out of the house, but my wife caught me in her arms and held me back. By the time I got outside, the man was gone. On the tool house door was the same drawing I copied before. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find the man. However, in the morning, when I looked at the tool house door again, I saw a second line of dancing men. This new line is very short, but I made a copy and here it is. Hilton Cubitt gave another piece of paper to Holmes. I could see that Holmes was very excited. Tell me, he said, was this second line of figures separate from the first? It was on a different part of the door. Excellent, cried Holmes. This last drawing is very important. It makes me feel hopeful. Please, continue your interesting story. I've nothing more to say, replied Hilton Cubitt, except I was angry with Elsie for holding me back. I'm sure she knows who this man is and what these pictures mean. Now I must go back to Norfolk. Elsie is very frightened, and I don't want to leave her alone at night. Well, said Holmes, please leave these pictures with me. I will examine them carefully. I think I'll be able to solve the mystery soon. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. As soon as Hilton Cupid left the room, Holmes ran to a table. He put all the papers with pictures of dancing men on the table. He began to examine them carefully. For the next two hours, Holmes worked hard examining the papers. At last, he jumped up excitedly. Then he sat down again and wrote out a long telegram. As soon as we get an answer to this telegram, Watson, he said, we'll visit Mr. Cupid in Norfolk. I have some important information for him. I was very curious about the telegram. I very much wanted to know what Holmes had found out about the meaning of the dancing men. But I didn't ask any questions. I knew Holmes would tell me when he was ready. 
Two days passed. Then, on the evening of the second day, Holmes received another letter from Hilton Cubitt. In this letter, Mr. Cubitt said he had found a new drawing of dancing men. He had found the drawing that morning on the sundial in the garden. Mr. Cubitt had made a copy of the drawing in his letter. Holmes examined these pictures carefully. Suddenly, he jumped up. We must go to Norfolk at once, Watson, he said. At that moment, a telegram arrived for Holmes. It was the answer he had been waiting for. Holmes read the telegram, and his face looked serious. Mr. Cubitt is in terrible danger, he said. He needs our help. But unfortunately, we were not able to go to Norfolk that evening. It was late, and the last train had gone. The next train was not until the morning. In the morning, we travelled to Norfolk. At the station, we asked our way to Ridlingthorpe Manor. Are you the detectives from London? the station master asked. Why do you think we are detectives from London? asked Holmes in surprise. Because the Norfolk police are already on their way to Ridlingthorpe Manor, said the station master. But perhaps you are doctors. The lady isn't dead yet. You may be in time to save her life. Holmes looked very worried. What do you mean? he asked. What has happened at Ridlingthorpe Manor? It's terrible news, replied the station master. Both Mr. Hilton Cubitt and his wife have been shot. Mr. Cubitt is dead, and his wife is seriously injured. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. At once, Holmes hurried to a carriage. During the journey to Ridlingthorpe Manor, he did not speak at all, but I could see he was very worried. Holmes had known that Hilton Cubitt was in danger, but he had not arrived in time to save his client. At last, we could see a large old house through the trees. This was Ridlingthorpe Manor. As we came near the front door, I saw the tool house and the sundial in the garden. These were the places where Hilton Cubitt had found pictures of dancing men. A carriage was standing outside the front door, and a small man was getting out. This man introduced himself as Inspector Martin of the Norfolk Police. Holmes introduced himself to Inspector Martin. Inspector Martin was very surprised when he heard my friend's name. But, Mr. Holmes, he said, the crime was committed only a few hours ago, at three o'clock this morning. How did you get here from London so quickly? When I left London, I didn't know a crime had been committed, replied Holmes. I was on my way here to prevent a crime, but I'd arrived too late. Now, Inspector Martin, shall we work together on this investigation, or do you want to work alone? I'd be very pleased to work with you, replied the inspector. Good, said Holmes. Then let's try to find out what happened. At that moment, the doctor, an old white-haired man, came downstairs from Mrs. Cubitt's room. The doctor said the lady was very badly injured, but that she would not die. The bullet which wounded Mrs. Cubitt had gone into her brain. The gun which fired the bullet had been very close to her. Hilton Cubitt had been shot through the heart. A gun had been found lying halfway between the two bodies. Two shots had been fired from the gun. But we did not know if Mrs. Cubitt had shot her husband first and then shot herself, or if Mr. Cubitt had shot his wife and then killed himself. Has Mr. Cubitt's body been moved? asked Holmes. No, replied the doctor. We had to move the lady. We couldn't leave her lying injured on the floor. Who found the body? Uh, two of the servants, said the doctor. Then let's hear their story, said Holmes. The two women told their story very clearly. They had been awakened from their sleep by a loud noise. A minute later, they heard another noise. Both women ran downstairs from their rooms. The door of a downstairs room was open, and Mr. Cubitt lay dead on the floor. Near the window, his wife was sitting with her head against the wall. One side of her face 
was red with blood. The window was shut, and the room was full of smoke and the smell of gunpowder. Immediately, the two servants sent for the doctor. When he arrived, they carried Mrs. Cupid upstairs. The servants did not understand why the crime had been committed. Mister and Mrs. Cupid had been in love with each other and had never quarrelled. Tell me," said Holmes, "when did you first notice the smell of gunpowder?" When we ran out of our rooms upstairs," replied the women. "Good," said Holmes. "Now let's examine the room downstairs." The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. The room was small, with a window looking onto the garden. Mister Cubitt's body lay on the floor. "You can take away the body now," said Holmes. Then he turned to the doctor. "Have you found the bullet which injured Missus Cubitt?" he asked.、Uh, "No," replied the doctor. "The bullet is still somewhere in her brain." We will have to operate to remove the bullet. We know that two bullets were fired from the gun," said Inspector Martin, "and we know where each bullet went. One bullet killed Mister Cubitt, and the other injured his wife." "Yes," said Holmes. "But what about the third bullet, the bullet which passed through the window frame?" He turned suddenly and pointed to a hole in the bottom of the window frame. This hole was the exact shape and size of a bullet. Wonderful! cried Inspector Martin. Then three shots were fired, not two. A third person was in the room. But Mister Holmes, how did you know a bullet had passed through the window frame? Well, said Holmes, you remember that the two servants smelt gunpowder as soon as they left their rooms. Yes," said the inspector, "but I still don't understand. The servants' rooms are upstairs, but the gun was fired downstairs. So the smell of the gunpowder must have been blown from this room to the rooms upstairs. Therefore, the window must have been open. A third person could have stood outside the window and fired through it. If somebody inside the room fired at this person and missed. The bullet would pass through the window frame. I understand," said Inspector Martin. "But when the servants entered this room, they said the window was shut. That was because Missus Cubitt had just shut it," replied Holmes. "But what's this?" A lady's handbag was standing on a small table. I saw it was full of money. The money was tied together. We counted twenty fifty-pound notes. This money is important evidence," said Holmes. "And now let's find out where the third bullet went after it passed through the window frame." We all went outside into the garden. There were flowers planted underneath the window. The flowers were broken, and there were large footprints on the ground. Holmes searched in the grass. Suddenly, he bent forward and picked something up. It was the missing bullet. "I think, Inspector," he said, "that our case is nearly solved." But Mister Holmes said the inspector, "Who was this other person, and how did he get away?" "I will tell you later," said Holmes. "First, I want to know if there is a place near here called Elridge's." We asked the servants, but none of them had ever heard the name. Then the boy who worked with the horses remembered a farm with that name. This farm was a very lonely place, many miles away, near a village called East Rushton. Holmes thought for a moment, then he smiled strangely. "Bring a horse," he said to the boy. "I want you to take a message to Elridge's farm." Then Holmes took from his pocket all the papers with the pictures of the dancing men on them. He sat down at a table and worked carefully. Finally, he handed a note to the boy. "Give this note to the person whose name is written on the outside," said Holmes. And don't answer any questions. I looked at the outside of the note. It was addressed in large writing to Mister Abe Slaney, Elridge's Farm, East Rushton, Norfolk. Then Holmes turned to Inspector Martin. 
I think you should get more policemen, he said. We'll have to catch a dangerous criminal. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. After the boy had left, Holmes gave some instructions to the servants. If anybody comes and asks for Mrs. Cubitt, he said, do not tell the person that she is ill. Show the person straight into the sitting room. There are some things I want to explain, Holmes said. Then he told the inspector about Hilton Cubitt's visits to us in London and the pictures of the dancing men. These drawings are a kind of secret writing, said Holmes. They look like children's drawings, but they are messages. Each picture of a dancing man is a letter of the alphabet. Let me show you how it works. The letter of the alphabet which appears most often in English is E. The picture of the dancing man which appeared most often was this. So I knew that this picture was E. Some of the dancing men were holding flags. I guessed that a figure with a flag was the last letter of a word. But how did you find out what the other pictures meant? I asked. On Hilton Cubitt's second visit, went on Holmes, he brought three different messages with him. The last message was this. In this message there was no flag, so the message had to be one single word. What could it be? The word had five letters, and the second and fourth letters were E. It might be sever, or lever, or never. But the most probable of these words was never. So I knew these pictures were N, V, and R. Excellent, Holmes, I cried. What did you do next? Well, said Holmes, I knew Mrs. Cubitt's first name was Elsie. I noticed that there was another word which had five letters and began and ended with E. So I guessed that these probably were L, S, and I. In one message, the word Elsie was written twice. In this message, the word before Elsie had four letters and ended with E. I guessed the writer was asking Elsie to do something. So now I looked for an English word of four letters ending in E. The best word I could think of was come. So now I knew that these were C, O, and M. Then I looked again at the first message which Hilton Cubitt brought us. I used the figures holding flags to divide the message into words. I wrote out the message, putting dots for the letters I didn't know. Dot M, dot E R E, dot dot E, S L dot N E, dot. The first missing letter had to be A, and the second letter had to be H. M here. A dot E, S L A N E. Dot. Clearly, the two missing letters were part of somebody's name, so it must be M here, Abe Slaney. Then I looked at the second message again. This message worked out like this: A dot E L R I dot E S. Here, I worked out that the missing letters could be T and G. At Elridge's, I decided to find out if there was a place near Ridlingthorpe Manor that was called Elridge's. If there was, then I knew that this was where the writer of the messages was staying. Inspector Martin and I looked at Holmes. It was wonderful how my friend had found out the meaning of the dancing men. What did you do then, Mister Holmes? Asked the inspector. I guessed that Abe Slaney was an American, 
Abe is an American name, and Mrs. Cupid had recently received a letter from America. This letter had upset her very much. So I sent a telegram to a friend in the New York police, asking about Abe Slaney. This was the reply: the most dangerous crook in Chicago. The same evening, I received Hilton Cupid's final message. The message worked out like this: Elsie. Dot. R E. Dot. A R E. To meet thy G O. Dot. Clearly, the missing letters had to be P and D. Elsie, prepare to meet thy God. I knew the Cubits were in terrible danger. Abe Slaney was saying he was going to kill Mrs. Cubit, so Doctor Watson and I hurried immediately to Norfolk. But unfortunately, we were too late. Hilton Cubit was dead. But what about Abe Slaney, Mister Holmes? Asked Inspector Martin. If he is the murderer and he's at Elridge's, he may escape. Don't worry, said Holmes. He won't escape. He's coming here. Here, said Inspector Martin in surprise. Why should he come here? Because I have written and asked him to come here. Holmes stood up and walked to the window. Look, here he is. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. A man was coming up the path. He was tall and handsome, with a large black beard. The front doorbell rang loudly. Hide behind the door," said Holmes quietly. "This man is very dangerous, and we must be careful." We waited in silence for a minute. Then the sitting room door opened, and a man stepped into the room. At once, Holmes put a gun against his head, and Inspector Martin put handcuffs on his wrists. The man looked at us. His black eyes looked angry. I received a note from Mrs. Cubitt," he said. "Where is she?" "Mrs. Cubitt is badly injured," replied Holmes. "Her life is in great danger." The man cried out. He sat down on a chair and put his face in his hands. "I didn't know she was injured," he said. "I shot her husband when he tried to kill me, but I would never injure Elsie. I love her more than anything in the world." Suddenly the man looked up. "Wait," he said. "If Elsie is badly injured, who wrote this?" He opened his hands and threw a note onto the table. "I wrote it to make you come here," said Holmes. "You wrote it, but how could you know the meaning of the dancing man?" "I worked out what the figures meant," replied Holmes. "But now, tell us your story." All right," said the man. "If Elsie dies, it doesn't matter what happens to me. My name is Abe Slaney, and I've known Elsie since she was a child. Her father was head of a gang of crooks in Chicago, and I was a member of the gang. Elsie's father thought of the secret writing of the dancing men. The members of the gang used it to send messages to one another. Elsie and I were engaged to be married, but Elsie hated her father's business. And she didn't want to be married to a criminal, so she ran away to England. She met and married this Englishman, Hilton Cubit. I wrote to Elsie, but she didn't answer my letters. In the end, I came to England and stayed at Elridge's farm. I knew Elsie understood the pictures of the dancing men, so I left messages where she would see them. In the messages, I asked her to come away with me, but her only answer was, "Never." Then Elsie wrote me a letter. She said she would meet me at three o'clock in the morning, when her husband was asleep. She brought money with her. She offered me the money and asked me to go away. I became angry and tried to pull her through the window. Just then, her husband rushed in carrying a gun. He fired the gun at me and missed. At the same moment, I shot at him, and he fell down dead. I ran across the garden. As I ran, I heard the window shut behind me. I've told you the truth, gentlemen. 
I didn't know Elsie was hurt. She must have shot herself after I left. While Abe Slaney was talking, a carriage arrived with two policemen in it. Inspector Martin turned to his prisoner. It's time for us to go, Slaney. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. I hope I'll work with you again one day. As the carriage drove away, I saw the note which Abe Slaney had thrown on the table. This was what Holmes had written. If you work it out, Watson, said Holmes, you'll find it means come here at once. I knew Abe Slaney would come when he read the note. He would think Mrs. Cubitt had written it. Well, I said, criminals have used the dancing men to help them in their crimes, but now the dancing men have been used to catch a criminal. Yes, said Holmes, the dancing men have finally done some good. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. It was six o'clock. I was tired. It was time to go home. I did not like my work in the shop. I often had headaches, and my feet were always tired. The streets were hot and busy. Everybody was going home. Their faces looked sad. I passed a flower shop. It was dark and quiet. The flowers smelled sweet and their leaves were wet. I stopped. I looked in my purse. I had a little money. I went into the shop and bought a bunch of flowers. At home, I put the flowers in a vase. They looked beautiful. I put the vase on the table. I began to make supper. My father came in. Where's my food? he said. Nearly ready, father, I said. He picked up a bottle of whiskey. He poured some into a glass. The bottle was nearly empty. Give me some money, girl, he said. I need some more whiskey. You don't need any more, I said. Please, father, don't buy any more. Shut up and give me some money, he said. I haven't got any, I said. My father was angry. He began to shout at me. He pointed to the flowers. You spend money on flowers, he said. He picked up the vase and threw it on the floor. The vase broke. My father went out and shut the door with a bang. He will get money from a friend, I thought. He will come home drunk again tonight. I picked up the broken flowers and threw them away. Somebody knocked at the door. I did not want to open it. It isn't a friend, I thought. Nobody comes here now. The person knocked again and called my name. I opened the door. It was the old man from next door. Come in, George, I said. Old George came in and sat down. I heard your father, he said. You poor girl. Can I help you? I wanted to talk to old George. What can I do, I said. Father drinks whiskey all the time. He hasn't got a job. He takes all my money and spends it on drink. Today I bought some flowers. He was angry. He broke the vase. Sometimes I hate him. Do you like flowers? asked old George. I love them, I said. But they cost a lot of money. Why don't you grow some on your balcony? Grow flowers? I asked. I'll show you, said old George. I was a gardener once. The next day I came home quickly from work. George was waiting outside his flat. Come and see, he said. I went inside the old man's flat. He had some flower pots 
and some packets of seeds. George and I carried the flower pots into my flat. We filled them with earth and planted the seeds. We put the pots on the balcony. Every evening, George and I worked in our balcony garden. George taught me a lot about flowers. He talked about different flowers, about their colour and beauty. I was happy in my garden. I forgot about my father and my hard work at the shop. George was my friend. I was not lonely any more. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Months passed. My garden became larger and more beautiful. The flowers opened. My father never came onto the balcony. He did not like flowers. He did not like George. My father was drinking all the time. He always asked me for money, and he often hit me. He looked ill. George was ill too. He coughed and coughed. He was thin and weak. Sometimes he did not come to our garden. He did not leave his bed. One day I cooked some food and took it to George. He was lying in bed. He did not turn and smile at me. He did not move. I went closer to him. His eyes were open. I touched his hand. It was cold. He was dead. I went back to our flat. My father was there. He was waiting for his supper. George is dead, I said. I began to cry. He was kind to me. I will miss him. My father looked at me, but he said nothing. He took some money and went out of the house. My father came home late that night. Why are you crying? he said. Are you crying for George? You loved that silly old man, didn't you? What about me? I'm your father. You don't care about me. I said nothing. My father began to shout. I've got a surprise for you, my girl. A nice young man. What do you think of that? He's a good boy. He's a friend of mine. You need a man, not a garden. I stared at my father. I said nothing. Look at yourself, my father said. You're not pretty, and you're getting old. Nobody else will marry you. No, father, no, I said. I'm not going to marry anybody. I'm staying here. I don't want to leave my garden. Your garden? Your garden? My father shouted. Your silly garden. You spend all your money on plants. You never give me money. You don't talk to me. You talk to old George. I hated him. And I hate your garden. I ran away from my father. I went to my bedroom and locked the door. There was a lot of noise. My father was shouting and breaking things. After a long time, the noise stopped. I left my bedroom and went to the balcony. The balcony door was open. I looked out. The pots were broken and the plants were torn to pieces. The garden was ruined. I went to my father's room. I hate him.
I said to myself. I'll tell him. He can kill me. I don't care. My father's door was locked. I banged and shouted. He did not open it. He did not hear me. He was asleep. He was drunk. I went back to my room. What shall I do? I thought. Where shall I go? I looked round the room. I took some clothes and packed them in a bag. I found some packets of flower seeds and put them in the bag. Then I took my purse and counted my money. I did not have very much. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I left the flat and shut the door quietly. I stood outside George's door for a minute. I wanted to say goodbye. It was dark outside. The roads were empty. There were no cars or people. It was very late. I must leave the town, I said to myself. I must go to the country. Perhaps I can work in a garden. Some hours later, morning came. People were going to work. There were some cars on the road. A bus came along. It stopped near me. I climbed onto it. On the bus, I fell asleep. Then somebody touched my arm. I woke up. The bus stops here, a man said. You must get off. I got off the bus and looked round. I was in a small village. The town was far away. I was hungry. I went to a cafe and sat down. I bought some bread and tea. Now I had very little money. I must find work, I thought. I spoke to the waiter. Can you help me? I asked him. I don't know this place. I need work. I can work as a gardener. Who can give me a job? The waiter thought for a moment. There's a Mrs. Jack, he said. She's got a market garden. Perhaps she can help you. Mrs. Jack's market garden was two miles away. I was very tired, but I walked fast. The garden was on the side of a hill. There was a notice over the gate. Jack's garden. Fresh vegetables and fruit for sale. I stood at the gate and looked inside. I saw a long line of greenhouses and a field of fruit trees. There was a small house behind the field. I liked the place. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. A woman came out of the house. She saw me at the gate and came up to me. Who are you? she said. What do you want? Can you give me a job? I asked. No work here, said the woman. She turned and walked away. Suddenly, she stopped and came back. Wait a minute, she said. We have a new greenhouse. I'll need some help. Come with me. I followed Mrs. Jack to the house. She asked me many questions about plants and gardening. I knew the answers. Old George was a good teacher. I'll give you a job, said Mrs. Jack. You can start today. She smiled for the first time. Mrs. Jack gave me a room in her house. I worked hard for her and I loved the work. I liked the country. I liked the fresh air and the sunshine. I did not think about my father, but I often thought about George. Mrs. Jack was kind. She paid me well for my work and gave me good food. But I did not like her son Harry. He was a big man with thick glasses. 
He did not talk much or smile. He watched me all the time. His eyes followed me. One day I was working in the new greenhouse. I was watering the tomatoes. I'm safe here, I thought to myself. I'm far away from my father and his friend. I heard somebody behind me. I turned round. It was Harry. He took my hand and smiled at me. I like you, he said. You're a nice girl. I pushed Harry away. Go away, I said. Don't touch me. I hate men. You're all the same. You drink and fight and break things. Leave me alone. I ran out of the greenhouse. I wanted to be alone. After that day, Harry did not look at me. He did not speak to me. I was glad. One day, I had an idea. I need my own little garden, I thought. I'll grow some flowers. Then I will forget about father and Harry. I'll make something beautiful. There was a small piece of ground near the house. I pulled out the weeds and dug the earth. I had George's packet of flower seeds. I planted them in my new garden and watched them grow. My new garden grew well. The flowers had beautiful colours. They smelt sweet. One day, Mrs. Jack visited my garden. Look, Mrs. Jack, I said. Flowers grow well here. Why don't we grow some in the market garden? You sell fruit and vegetables. We can sell flowers too. You can make more money. That's a good idea, Mrs. Jack said. It's your idea, and you can do the work. But where will you sell the flowers? There's no flower shop here. I remembered the flower shop in the city. It was near my father's flat. I bought my first bunch of flowers in that shop. Next day, I got up early. I picked some of my best flowers. I took the bus to the city. In the city, the streets were hot. The people looked tired. Life is better in the country, I thought. The people in the country are happier. I walked quickly to the flower shop. I looked round all the time. I did not want to meet my father. The people in the shop were friendly. Yes, we'll buy your flowers, said the manager. They are very, very beautiful. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. I was pleased. I thought of Mrs. Jack and my garden in the country. I wanted to go back at once. I left the shop and began to walk quickly. On the corner of the street there was a beggar. He was old and very thin. His clothes were dirty. He had dirty hair and red eyes. He put out his hand. Help me, lady, he said. Help a poor old man. I knew his voice. I looked at him. It was my father. I wanted to run away. I wanted to go back to the country and forget my father forever. But I stood still. I felt sorry for him. Father, I said. His old red eyes looked up. There were tears in them. He knew me. It's you, he said. What happened to you, father? I asked. You ran away, he said. You left me. I was ill for a long time. I was lonely without you. I was a bad father, but you were always a good daughter. 
You worked hard. I took all your money, and sometimes I hit you. I broke up your garden. I... Don't talk about it, father, I said. I wanted to buy whiskey, he said, but I didn't have any money. My friends left me. They didn't want me any more. Now I'm a lonely old man. I stand here and beg. Sometimes people give me a little money. I get a little food. I sold the furniture in the flat, but I kept your things for you. I thought again of my new life in the country. I felt all round me the sadness of the city. I took my father's arm. Come on, father, I said. We're going home. There was not much furniture in the flat. There were dirty cups and plates in the kitchen. There was a bad smell of dirt and old food. I looked round sadly. My father saw my face. Everything is dirty, he said. I can't clean the flat. You made everything nice. I needed you here. I did not say anything. I went to my room. Everything was the same. I thought of my last night at home. It was a long time ago. I went back to my father. I began to clean the flat. The next day, I wrote a letter to Mrs. Jack. I told her everything. I am sorry. I cannot work for you any more, I wrote. I must stay here and look after my father. I began my old life once more. I took my old job again. I came home every evening and cooked for my father. I did not make my garden again. I felt too sad. My father was very different now. He did not drink any more. He looked much older. He talked to me kindly. But he lived in the past. Sometimes he talked to my mother. But my mother was dead. She died a long time ago. One evening, somebody knocked on the door. I opened it. It was Mrs. Jack's son, Harry. He was holding a large bunch of flowers. They were flowers from my little garden in the country. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. We're selling flowers to the flower shop now, he said. I bring them to the city every week. But these... Are for you. He gave me the flowers and left quickly. The flowers were beautiful. I'll make my balcony garden again, I thought. I worked on my garden every evening. Soon flowers began to grow on the balcony again. My father liked the garden. He sat all day on the balcony. Sometimes he slept. Sometimes he talked to himself. Harry came every week and brought me flowers. He never spoke. He gave me the flowers and went away. Come in and have a cup of tea, Harry, I said one day. He came in and sat down quietly. Come and see my balcony garden, I said. My father was sitting on the balcony. Harry sat down beside him. I went to the kitchen and made some tea. I heard their voices. They were laughing. I was happy. The old man needs a friend, I thought. Harry was kind to my father. They talked and laughed. I watched them. 
I was wrong about Harry, I thought. He is kind and gentle. Every week, Harry came to the flat. He and my father became friends. My father loved his visits. I often looked at Harry. Behind the thick glasses, his eyes were kind and gentle. He often smiled now. I saw other things too. I saw his kindness to my father. I saw his love for flowers. One day I was watering the plants in my balcony garden. My father was asleep in the sun. Harry came up to me. He put his arms round me. I want to ask you something, he said. Yes, Harry, I said. I'm listening. But Harry said nothing. I looked at his eyes. I understood. It's all right, Harry, I said. The answer is yes. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want.